everybody. Welcome again to Primary Sources. My name is Mindy Johnson and it is my great pleasure to spend the next um, short time with you while we get an opportunity to explore some really uh, exciting topics with one of the greats within animation. So uh, to get us underway, wanted to um, take us through a look at what we're going to be exploring today. When we think about story, which is a large part of what we do here as visual storytellers, um, every great story generally begin, has a beginning. And one of the classic lines, and, and what this does is trigger some incredible worlds. It sets you into the place and space of what we're going to be sharing when we, when we enter a story. But it's what, a part of what has begun so many great stories for centuries, once upon a time. In the course of, of great storytelling, uh, story is very different. Um, and I like the description here with story, to ornament with pictured scenes as from history or a legend, to tell the history or story of. Um, and that's a key part of, of as storytellers, visual storytellers, what we need to do to find a way to bring these words alive from the page. As readers, we have our own imaginative approach, but sometimes those imaginations can be a little limited <laughs> in, in the minds of some readers. And the great art of approaching story from a film takes it to a whole new level, to a definitive interpretation. So when we sit down to be making films, uh, beginning with a script, we're still on the printed page, fading in to different scenes and uh, different environments. But it's a big part of that leap from the printed page to the screen to capture audiences, to be able to visualize something, to tell that story visually that's so iconic, so visually strong that we can't help but experience it emotionally, whether it's through laughter or tears. Um, and that's part of the magic as visual storytellers. And that ability to visualize is so key to uh, what we do as storytellers. Mental images or pictures, perceptible to the mind or the imagination. And the mind's eye is a powerful thing, and particularly the mind's eye of visual storytellers. Uh, the ability to go into the imagination and find that way of telling the story and then the tool, skills to be able to convey it to the artists that you have around you to be able to make that message and that impact reach an audience. So what explodes in the mind of a storyteller <laughs> is also part of what can be ignited in the mind of a reader. And so working from those magical stories and finding ways to breathe life visually into them is a big part of what we're looking at today, where the story can leap from the page, literally, and into the minds and hearts of audiences. That's a big gap to cover. And fortunately for us, we have one of the top people in the industry who's uh, one of the gift, most gifted visualization artists in storytelling. Her career began at, at very early on uh, in uh, filmation and, and working as a layout artist and an animator at Disney, working under some of the greats, Eric Larson, Don Bluth. And as part of the training series, she worked on many great early uh, classic Bluth films from Banjo the Woodpile, Cat, Secret of Nim, American Tale, All Dogs Go to Heaven. Great, great stories. Moving to Disney, she was a key part of some of the legendary classics that were a big part of what have returned us to animated glory today. And working on some of the most iconic characters there as an animator. And as a true storyteller working in story and as a director, Lorna has brought us some of the most beautiful visual feasts we can see on film. Um, just epic pieces and, and her work on Spirit as co-director with Kelly Asbury was uh, brought her an Academy Award nomination and the first woman to be nominated for an Academy Award as a director for Best Picture Animation. 
So without further ado, it is my great, great pleasure to welcome to Primary Sources the amazing Lorna Cook. Lorna, thank you so much for being here. My and pleasure. you can get your camera back on. Good to see you, Mindy. <laughs> so, so it's great to see you. And I'm, I'm just so elated that you're able to spend time with us today and to dive into this idea of visualizing the story. Now, I couldn't think of when this topic came up, I couldn't think of anyone but you because you have had such a strong, these two films we're going to be looking at today um, that you've had such a strong impact on, I think are two of the most powerful examples of visualization and, and just sort of sweeping epic scopes to these films as well and how your work masterfully handled these topics. So let's go back to when you began your career. You really were working with and training under some of our great legends. Eric Larson, my goodness, talk a little bit about, and Don Bluth, talk a bit about their impact on you as a storyteller, filmmaker, sure. Sure. and what you learned from them. Well, you know, I was extremely young when I was able to go to Disney in their, their one of their first training programs. And originally I had uh, geared my, my career towards illustration. But when the opportunity came up, I thought I, I've got to try and I submitted a portfolio. And there I was, a, really just a newbie beyond belief, you know, and being in the, in the presence of these gentlemen, it, it was overwhelming. I got sick the first week I was there at the studio. I was so nervous about it. I didn't understand flipping pa paper or, you know, starting to look at things in a new way. But Eric Larson, was extremely kind and candid and helpful. And he had, you know, an unbelievable amount of patience for this new, you know, this young woman who's like, I want to, I want to do this. So I felt extremely honored to be amongst those great men. And uh, Ollie Johnson, of course, was there and uh, Willie Reitman, you know, there were still some real heavy hitters there at the time. So it was extraordinary to be in their presence. And uh, people who invented this art form in yeah. many ways, really expanding it to that point. And I think when you are <clears throat> given that opportunity so early in your career, the level of excellence has already been <laughs> kind of established. You know, you're you're there seeing the movies that, and uh, many of the scenes that you grew up with, because we could go into the uh, library there and look at extraordinary work from all these other animators. So it was, it was an amazing start and um, very humbling. So I, I just was such a young person at the time. And then I also met uh, Don Blues there and that, you know, was a later, time of, of working together but yeah I had a, an incredible start uh, yeah. and what kind of uh, lessons did you learn or insights that you learned from them that you still carry with you today as, as a storyteller well I would say the disciplinary aspect of it you can't just expect to understand an art form you know I'll, I'll get it in a year it, it took years <laughs> of the apprenticeship i mean even if you were extremely talented you still had to learn how to work together become a storyteller all of these things and um you know much later in my life when i was training animators in in ireland it was extraordinarily weird to have these kids like i want your job and i want it you know by a certain time but they learned you know you have to serve your your apprenticeship you have to understand so many aspects of of being good at a skill so yeah yeah it, well lasting impact and it, clearly you know you've carried their influences forward in your storytelling because you've you've taken animation through your films to new levels as well i mean it's always about keeping the the craft moving forward um now, you've worked as an animator on some really iconic films. <laughs> um, how did story, you, you worked in animation, but then how did you make this transition into story? Well, I, 
went back to Disney Studios on Beauty and the Beast. And I was uh, very fortunate to be uh, working with some wonderful animators and I was in the bell unit. And uh, it, it was, you know, again, that wonderful feeling of I'm, I'm working on a movie that's going to make some big impact. <laughs> and it was, it was great. I had spent many years with, with uh, Don Bluth making, you know, a lot of films and learning my craft continuously, but it was time to go back to Disney. And I, I really think after that film, actually I met Brenda Chapman on that film. And so when Beauty was done, I really had a desire to go into storyboarding. I had done a little bit earlier uh, and I, I just loved it. And so I made that switch on The Lion King. And Brenda it, was a head of story on Belle, wasn't she? Or uh, on, Beauty, uh, on Beauty and the Beast. Beast uh, well, yeah. actually she was in story yeah. and um, she was head of story on Lion King. Lion King. There. And it was, a really kind of nerve-wracking thing to say I'm switching gears here I've been an animator for so long now I want to go into storyboarding but there was it was so alluring to me to be able to visualize whole sequences of the film rather than and I'm not you know putting any uh there was no loss being an animator I loved it but you, you would do your sequence or you were able to do several scenes in a row and it was wonderful to, you know, have this performance. But storyboarding was, to me, the next step to really visualize the bigger picture. And I had to learn all, all over again because I was working with some, you know, terrific talent there on uh, The Lion King. And I watched my, my growth, I mean, I was, how do I begin? I'll just use a pencil. And it was, no, use a China marker back then. And that was Brenda. And it, it, it just opened up the whole spectrum of things because of the way it felt, of, of the contrast you could get, the freedom, you know, in a, in a China marker. So you can know how long ago that was. But I started to look at other people's work you know, you're surrounded by talent. It's like an osmosis effect. You, you really, you know, it's a wonderful exchange. And I knew, I, I knew that was a great move because boarding was then, you know, I went on to Mulan and then um, I, I went on to DreamWorks. I don't look back, hey, continued your, your impact on the story on so many great films is, is definitely present. And did you feel like you finally found your place, found your voice, or it was all leading to story? Or do you still, uh, you've had opportunities to get back into animating, but... Um, I, I never, I did regret moving on to story because it, I, I still storyboard. So it's just, you know, a wonderful tool to have. And, and if you want to see something, you can, you know, go ahead and, and Walk it out, but I really was. I think I had found my my kind of happy place when I was boarding, and um, you know, and onward. One of those happy discoveries you had, you know, at the time when you began in animation. Um, sometimes we have to progress through those things to before we land where we need to be. I think. Yeah, it, it was a good move. I, I really felt that, and. Um, <laughs> Did you feel then as you were animating, is are there any examples where your animation helped support story or, or uh, were there any uh, of the work you were doing on uh, beauty? Did that, was it seeing other people or was it through the course of your work as an animator that said, that where you said, wait a minute, if I have Belle move in this way, it might help expand the, the story moment at this particular scene. Is there any example of that? Well, I almost look at it in, in the reverse to a degree because the storyboarding process is very exacting. And I learned as an animator to also appreciate that part of, of the process so much because that's the first blueprint of the movie. You've got to have the ability to tell that story 
you know, and create it in an animatic before you start animating. And the beats have to be there, the emotion has to be there as best it can, and now it's even more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So I, I put so much stock into the boarding process. And I would get those storyboards for the scene I was animating and, and study them. And, you know, they, those were the, the, the kickoff point. They were the real, you know, inspiration. And sure, you know, you can talk about the, the acting and how you're going to further it and, oh, no, let, let's do this and how oh, her emotion would be that. But it comes, the, you know, the real um, armature is in story. Act in story. I can't say it, say it enough because that, that's always changing, you know, usually throughout the, the making of the film, too. You're always refining until it's finally, you got to, you know, get it in the can. So talking about storyboarding and your work within the story, you've worked on such a range of films, both in the scope and style. Um, how do you fit a visual sense to the story? How do you, when you approach um, what you're doing to the story that you're telling, um, let's, we have some examples of, uh, does it start with character? Are you starting with environment? Are you starting with, uh, going back to the story itself? Um, well, you um, know, in, say, in Prince of Egypt, mm -hmm. it was the inspiration, obviously, to tell an epic, one of the most epic stories. I mean, this was Jeffrey Katzenberg's real desire. There was a lot of influence of what he had seen with the uh, paintings of Doré and the feeling he wanted, you know, but the emotional and, and visual sense is something that gets discussed ad nauseum. You know, what, what kind of a story are we telling? Epic tale. It has to, you know, be magnificent, cinematic, all of these things. And, um, you know, then you're developing character design. What kind of character, how will characters look to fit into this world? What kind of a you know, feeling do we want to get? How do we want to present a story that's been told many times on film? Uh, I mean, the classic Ten Commandments. So it was how do we bring our own uniqueness, particularly as a new studio, and, and do something really phenomenal? And um, it, to me, it was, it's always, who are you bringing together as your your creatives? And it was a, a beautiful mix of artists from all over. And we all, you know, it's that weird feeling that comes very few times in a lifetime creatively, where you go, okay, we're on to something big here. We're gonna do something Tremendous, and I, and when I was first pitched the idea from Jeffrey, we're going to do a Bible story. I thought, okay, you know, what could that be? Possibly Noah's Ark, you know, Adam, and, you know, Prince of Egypt. And then I I realized that was going to be a. I I nodded. I went, okay, <laughs> that sounds that sounds really compelling, and um, and it was a wonderful journey. Yeah. I can tell you. Um, is that what sparks you is sort of just this idea first of a story? I mean, what, what kind of a story appeals well, to you when telling? You know, at, at one time it was, what kind of story can we tell that only animation will be the proper way to deliver it? The lines are so blurred now, <laughs> you know? Um, so I, I think for me personally, at this stage, it's got to be resonating in some deep way, even if whether it's a comedic thing or, or it's a drama, it has to really be kind of a timeless, amazing story in, in its own right. Um, and then too, as artists, if you're given a challenge, like, okay, we're, gonna, we're going to tell the story of Moses liberating his people, take a deep breath and, you know, how do we do this? And 
of course, you know, to have all of the wonderful components. This, this was a movie that was, uh, it was a musical. You had Stephen Schwartz creating these incredible songs and Hans Zimmer doing the music. And so it, it carried the movie quite beautifully. It really did. And I, I remember I actually had the pleasure of boarding some of those songs and I was so inspired that, I mean, that's where you're going. It's not me. I know it sounds a little crazy. I'm, I'm getting a download of what I need to do. I mean, you hear the, the music and you hear the lyrics and get the inspiration as any artist would. Something very magical happens and you say, I, I see it, you know, and it's so hard to, well, I'm trying to describe it, but it is, those, those are the magical elements uh, like the music, the the magnificent artists, you know, all of them. Um, you talked about that being a perfect storm, and uh, let's go back to uh, not so much a rear view look at it, but a drive through look at it. When when you sat down with Jeffrey and he was telling you the idea of what this was going to be, and you were definitely opening up to that, as uh, talent came on board and they brought their gifts to the table of this film. You know, how, how does that spark your, your visualization? I mean, like you were saying with Steven Schwartz's music, what that really did to inspire you, um, really, so that collaborative element of visualizing what's right. happening. Talk a little bit about that. Well, it, and it's, it's in, you know, a process of iteration you, you, when you're designing characters, uh, you know, we had uh, so many incredible people with their point of view and how you have to narrow it down and how it's going to look in the world, you know. Um, Carter Goodrich, Peter DeSev, both a magnificent artists. And so, the, and the, the directors, you know, Brenda, Steve, and, and Simon, they knew what they were going for. And, and that, you've, it's a great thing when you've got you know, leadership that says, I know what we want to create here. I mean, yes, you have to discover it, but it was being led in, the, in a wonderful way. And the creatives who, who too numerous to mention, and I'm really sorry, I can't do that all, but, um, and you know, how we inspired each other. It's, it's a huge thing. Plus we were able to go on a research trip mm -hmm. to Egypt and, uh you know, when's that, is that going to happen again? But, so to be able to have that amazing opportunity, and it really did um, inspire beyond measure what the movie needed to look like. And uh, it, it always happens that way when it happened on Spirit too, you know, I, I can chat about that later, but, you know, getting those opportunities, um, you just don't know. Things kind of just bubble up in the most wonderful way. You see something, oh, that looks like that. We could use that. We could, you know, it's that kind of a process. But, you know, that was an amazing group of people that were just all coming together from amblimation. You know, it was a real, how the heck are we going to do this thing? And, uh, and it, for, for that group, but I think it, having that uh, great strong direction and leadership and, and the story itself is inspiring enough to get everyone on the same page with it. Let's look at some of the examples that you sure. put on it um, and talk a little bit about how you define the world, the, um, how the art direction and style of the film sort of helps to advance and support. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, so Matt, if we could pull up the Prince of Egypt imagery, great. Well, you know, you start with something like that, this huge head of Seti being, you know, pulled by slaves. You're, you're, you're giving the impression we're going to see something massive. And it was, you know, um, the idea of doing this and doing it in a sophisticated way too. I mean, the art direction is, is just beyond measure. I, I can't say enough about the look of this film because it is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful cinematic and, and uh, just there's an intelligence in the movie 
that I that I love and it just set the bar from you know frame one practically mm -hmm. stunning work yeah to uh, be sure uh, so Matt let's move to the next slide here yeah so again this is really in just saying how we wanted to deliver the epic scale of the film and you have these you know just massive locations that we were actually able to see again. So, you know, it, it's just wanting to show the immensity of the world. And um, I, I love the, just the simple composition of this, the symmetry, but yet the juxtaposition between this wide expanse of light against the darker foreground. And it's, it's Moses and Zipporah returning back to see Ramses. And it, it just had to feel overpowering and like, where are they going into again? You know, he's coming back a, a changed person, you know, and um, yeah. yeah. It's visually powerful. Yeah. So some of these examples, again, I, I grabbed because they just, there were so many. It, it, I, I would have, this would have been a five hour you know, uh, of vicious visuals. Let's but, go to the next one, I think is yeah. so in terms of the lighting. It, well, again, the scale, this is uh, Moses having found out that he really, uh, who he really is, that he was the son of a slave and he's coming back to his own part in the temple. And it's just on every level. I just love that shot. But again, this, you know, scale, the downshot of this tiny person and it's a great example of, of using the visual to help push that narrative forward. Yeah. It, it was that way at every at every turn. That, that's why I think the film delivers on, on so many levels. And in your development, are you looking at, um, you know, finding ways to convey that, finding ways to, you know, stay within the, the mind of the characters that are on the screen and find Absolutely. To visualize that? Yeah, I mean, we'll get to, to this slide in, in just a bit, but at its core, this was a story about two brothers with very different destinies, and that's what humanizes the story so much. If it was just about Moses coming to, you know, deliver his people, which happens, obviously, that's the story, but it, it, it had a very personal core and that that's where a lot of the emotion well and personalizing it um this is what I, always strikes me i've had the films on just sort of getting into the mix of of them the last few days here and it, just part of that subjective experience is so apparent you feel that isolation you feel that as a viewer because of these incredible visuals that are on screen and um and that to me is i think the great talent of of your work within story finding ways to help push the narrative forward right right um let's go to the next slide matt the, again back to these just epic scale of this yeah, i mean this is really at the end of the movie but again this is uh that feeling of well egypt crumbled it, you know, after the plagues and everything else and the people, you know, the, the Hebrews are, are free and leaving. And so, you know, we began the film with the grandeur of Egypt and the obvious demise. Um, but uh, again, it just a, you know, a really great example of the scale. Great, but also subtle in a way. I mean, yeah. so your eyes are on to that, but I mean, how heavy handed or not, how subtle do you, you, those are also qualifying determiners that you need to it, make. You're right. I mean, the emotion of the scene to me, it's, it's not victorious. That comes later. But this is a sad, you know, uh, exodus. I mean, it, it becomes more joyous as they make their way out. But, you know, it wasn't like, oh, wonderful, we've destroyed Egypt. It's there's there's a poignancy you know and transition there's change yeah. mm -hmm. underway let's go to the next slide a beautiful stunning talk about color as well yes. and that helped you know 
the color palette in, in this film, again, um, it, it, I, I don't want to overuse the word sophisticated, but it is. Mm -hmm. And there is a feeling of such beauty, particularly with you, you look at the, at the queen and her handmaidens and everything. I mean, the color palette, the feeling, the emotion, it's a tender moment. She's just discovered uh, Moses. And there and there is such a, a calm beauty about it, the, the coolness. It's really, you know, um, just a, one tiny example, so I grabbed it. I was okay. the scene. Yeah. And just the character design too, just oh, yeah. so exquisite in this it, film. It, it is, again, um, a, a real decision to be made, you know. Uh, and it was bold a bold decision it's it's very stylized but there have been several films in, in animation that have you know done that and it was um a, a good call that's all the way the magic of animation the ability to do just that and yeah. let's move to the next one again speaking of characters um and they yeah, yeah. I, again i i just this was the journey that these brothers take which goes from real genuine closeness to enemies is is really um, you know quite touching and, and in some ways very sad yet necessary and the the way that they start off and the good-natured fun and the camaraderie i mean moses loved his life before he found out <laughs> who he really was and and you know to discover that you're not who you thought you were is just such a blow. So we really do, as you said, get inside the uh, psyches of these characters, which makes it that much more exciting, that much more uh, compelling. So yeah. Next one. Let's uh, keep going with these great visuals. Yeah. I, again, I wanted to just. I love this shot too. It, it's it just plays so beautifully on every level of yeah. the scale. The actual conversation that's going on between Seti and, and Moses with, you know, the uh, statue in the background, right? You know, I, I think this is the kind of greatness that you can achieve visually without deterring from uh, the actual scene itself. It, it's so, it's just enjoyable to me to see how beautifully this film is created. I think as in watching it, you, there is such, it's such a gift for the eyes, but everything on the screen is there, you know, for a reason, you know? reverberating back to you about story and about yeah. character and, and position and role and dynamic and posture. And just, it's, uh, again, I mean, that's true in live action. You try to impress that on my students that you know you are seeing a controlled environment here for a reason, and everything there is there to help expand the story. Um, but never more so, I think. In that's truly more so in animation, um, because it is so designed and controlled for a reason. And, and you've got so many different departments needing to coordinate together and work together. You know the the layout department. I mean, this is obviously it's a it's a was a two D animated film, but it did not take away from the depth and again the grandeur of the film. It was so beautifully art directed and um, realized. It's just I think a real zenith in terms of animated storytelling. It just really is. Um, the next slide too just is. So visually stunning. I I love the sort of Papyrus kind of, um, you know, the, that whole sequence where uh, the walls literally, that sort of dream sequence are all coming alive. It's just... Right, right. That was um, Simon, actually. Yeah. ...boarded that. And this, I, I chose this because when we were in Egypt and we were on the Nile, we got to go and... and look at the walls of several temples and there was something very similar to this with the, with the crocodiles and it was like oh wow this is when Moses finds out what happened you know what could have been his fate 
and this is at the end of uh, at the dream, but it it's just magnificent in its uh, composition and the scale. Once again, it's so compelling. And you know, forgive me for using the same words. I really don't want to repeat myself, but obviously, the film visually, in my opinion, broke ground and emotionally. Yeah. And that's why I think it, it has a very timeless feel. Absolutely. Nothing redundant about that. Um, let's go to the next slide, Matt. Again. Yeah, again, just a fantastic um, moment. This is mom uh, when Moses comes back and he uh, meets Ramses again, who originally wants to embrace him, but Moses is, uh, I'm sorry, I have changed and I'll show you how. And he shows him the staff and it turns into a snake and he can't, you know, obviously he can't stay. But I, I loved the composition of this, the cool hues, the, you know, it's not really welcoming, it's kind of standoffish and, you know, so. Yeah, again, another really strong example of that. As you said, the composition speaks volumes. Um, it's another challenge I often place to my students is the ability to turn the sound off and just visually watch anything. Sure. You can still, you should be able to tell what's happening. Absolutely. And evermore, animation really has such a, is such a masterful forum to be able to push that even further than live action in many ways. Next slide, Matt. Thank you. I, I chose these uh, next few because they were so dynamic. It's when the plagues are now upon Egypt. And um, it could be could have been done in a lot of other ways. But again, it's it's very, I think it's more of the emotion you get from seeing the graphicness of it. And we, we really didn't want to go so far off the path where it, it would get, uh, you know, uncomfortable. I mean, it is, it's a moment where <laughs> you've got frogs, you've got pestilence, you've got death, but it had to be done, you know, swiftly and kind of pack the punch. And the visualization again, like you said, you can get the information on the printed page, but then it's another level, another layer to take that and place it into a visual context. And right, in right. Of, uh, great storytellers, it's pushing even further. Um, and this is another really incredible example of that. Let's go to the next slide, Matt. Yeah, it was just another dynamic uh, mm -hmm. shot. And again, um, Let My People Go is playing, you know, against this. So we've got all of this drama going on and uh, and it's really kind of a, a, a duet between Moses and, and Ramses as, as the song is going, but it was difficult. I, I wanted, I culled so many from <laughs> the edit, you know, that I sent you, but again, I just wanted to get a couple of dynamic shots in here. Seeing gems from jewels, my goodness. There's... It, it was really difficult, you know, wealth of goodies. Every frame on, on this film is just stunning. Next one, Matt, if we could. Now, this was really a real challenge because this is the death of Ramsey's son and the death of the firstborn and, and how to create something that was powerful. It wasn't a thing, it was an energy. And it was, you know, the, like the energy of death. and we uh, talked about it long and hard. We, we uh, I remember working, you know, some ideas out uh, with Richie Chavez, who was an extraordinary uh, development person on the, on the film. And we got to this point where this thing would sweep through and, and you know, avoid the Hebrews with the blood on the lintel and, and go directly to Ramsey's son. And it was very powerful. And you say, okay, we, we have to show that people are dying, kids are dying. How do we do that? And it was the, just the sweep of this thing. And once it passed through the house, you would hear like the exhale of the, the child. And I, 
I really think it was handled with some graceful visuals, even though it had such huge impact. That's a challenge there. I mean, you, you're dealing with some very heavy themes. In the- it, it was. And, you know, how do we, how do we show it? How do we not, um, you know, belabor it? But it needed to be told, you know. And yeah. I, I think it was really powerful in a, in a really good way. Hand, yes, handled in a, in a strong visual sense, but uh, in a very masterful way. I mean, um, it's serving the story. Uh, nothing was gratuitous or, you know, gory for gore's sake. And too many storytellers, I think, veer off of that. And this is just one, a powerful example of uh, the impact of cinema, the impact of visual storytelling and um, the use of animation to do so. Yeah, and, and again, I will say it's it comes from, you know, the top, what the directors were envisioning, and there was a lot of, uh, this was a, a classy project on, on so many levels. Very so much. it had to really, you know, be that way all the way through. Very much so. Let's go to the next one again. Yeah. Speaking of emotion and composition, and again, heavy, heavy. Yeah. Drama. This is, I think, probably one of the most impactful moments in the film. It really was because, again, as the, the progression of these two brothers from really best friends as well as brothers to this separation and rejection, you know, yes, he allows, uh, Ramses allows Moses to take his people to go, but uh, their relationship is forever changed and gone. And, and, you know, Moses is sorry, he's apologetic, but it's, it's of no use at this moment. So it's, it's seeing that journey, you know, where it needed to finally arrive. Just the, you know, the visual sense of this, the composition is so strong, lighting as well to enhance that the emotion is palpable. Yeah. Again, Um, through this image in, in all levels of emotion from Moses and, to what Ramses is experiencing and, and just a singular image alone, but then to make this image move and to continue that impact of the emotion is masterful. Again, all, all pre thought out, this is all from the boards. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you enough that, and this is Simon Wells also, but it, it, it comes right from, you know, that, information that's been really thought out to the nth degree before it, it's even going to, to go into the hands of, of every talented animator. So, yeah. Masterful. We've got just a couple more from Prince of Egypt. Let's take a look at the next one, Matt. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, I had to put this in there. <laughs> it was, you know, just an incredible moment. moment. Yeah. And, and there's Moses. And he's, you know, obviously parting the Red Sea. And it was just extremely dynamic and powerful and swelling, as you know, with the music and what have you. So, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about technology and how that is, helps to support shaping visualizations. Well, we were just getting into more of, you know, working with CG far more, you know, than other films prior to that. And I personally will not speak on how they did it, but uh, it, it was really the beginnings of what we could do with it to create some incredible uh, scenes and moments. And, you know, particularly when you have crowds, obviously you've got, you know, how are you going to mitigate all of the crowds? You know, and CG obviously was well underway. But um, you know, from here, it just went forward. Yeah. And always to serve story, never to drive story. Yeah, absolutely. And our final image for Prince of Egypt, I think, again, this just uh, uh, eloquent. Yeah, you know. Country and, and now a new, a new vista ahead of him. It was wonderful. I mean, it was all with the song and score. We did not want to. He said what he needed to say prior to to you know the red sea and um now it was a matter of just the 
the final, you know, moments of, of his liberated people. So it's, it's a beautiful scene and, and it just ends, you know, right on, on. You bring up a good point about being, if saying what he needed to say and keeping uh, the spoken word at a minimum, are there ever choices? And I think as we move to, uh, we've got some great examples now, let's shift to spirit. Uh, I'm so excited for this because I, I think this film is really one of the uh, visually most stunning films uh, that I've seen in a long while. And it had to have been a challenge to sort of take this uh, environment and this story. And you guys set up some interesting challenges for yourself um, to, to convey a story where your primary your lead character doesn't really speak. No, uh, and that had to had to run its course too because we did a lot of sequences with talking spirit, talking Esperanza. We had a couple of other characters that disappeared in the process. So you were exploring that. Well, they yes, that was kind of the the beginnings of it, which seemed pretty normal, although. I, I really didn't love the idea of a talking horse, but it it was it needed to find um, its way through to the next level. And we were looking at sequences, and I just remember things weren't going particularly well. And uh, my dear friend Brenda Chapman <laughs> said, "Well, what if what if the horses don't speak?" Yeah, <laughs> of course, Jeffrey loved that. And, and that was the new challenge. And quite frankly, as most of the people in our business know, um, and, not, and not for every movie or TV show of animation, but in many of these films, the idea of showing the character, of showing it, don't say it, is really the mantra because you're relying on far more complex and uh, I think more, you know, emotional and creative ways of dealing with things. So again, not for every, every show or movie, but there's a tendency to think you can, you know, kind of talk through every scene and you don't allow the audience to even get a breath to imagine what the character is thinking and really spirit gave us that opportunity big time and and i'm really delighted because it's it's much more poetic and um and i think more emotional yeah talk a little bit about how the idea of this film came about uh, had was it based on anything was it a uh, i think again you know i was, I was after thing you found no, no, it was after Prince of Egypt, and um, I was on some other small things developing, and uh, I was told that Jeffrey wants to make a movie about a horse. And I thought, oh my God, that's, that's fantastic. I'm, you know, a huge horse lover. And we chatted about it, and we chatted about the difficulties of animating a horse, and I said, I think we can do this. I think we can do this. You know, what, what am I going to say? <laughs> no, we can't. But I did. I really did. And, and uh, James Baxter took the lead in creating Spirit's animation and some of the most marvelous yeah. work ever, along with all of the animators. It was such a challenge. But um, the idea of telling this story in the opening of the West told from the point of view of a horse that wouldn't speak um, was, you know, it made more sense as we went on. And we also had uh, music, well, Hans Zimmer did the music, but Brian Adams brought his expertise and he was the singing voice, if you will, of spirit. I mean, he, was helping us know what spirit was thinking in these various sequences, which I thought was really wonderful. And Matt Damon provided some um, 
narration. Yeah. And you probably, to your point, could have understood what was going on without it, but it was very, you know, it was a, a minute amount considering. Absolutely. I think that's what's, again, another terrific example of the placement of the voiceover um, and the use of it. It's, it's just perfectly done. It's not too much. It's not too little. It's just right where it needs to be. It went back and forth. I bet. Pick yeah. out that word, put in that word, you know. But um, it, it was to me a really kind of splendid exercise in storytelling and uh, I, I can't tell you enough how it's, much. It's a masterful example um, and rightfully so received a nomination for it. Um, I mean just the, some of the creative decisions that had to be made um, just in terms of the, the look, the, the style that's being utilized, color palettes, and all of that, because you've lost, you've made the decision to, to have this character not speak, um, and suddenly does that amplify everything else on the screen as far as what you need to do to push story? Well, I, I think it was more of how would we like this film to look and how do we celebrate some of the beauty of the West, which you can't find anywhere else, you know? And we did take a research trip, uh, eight national parks in four days. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. Um, and, you know, when you're seeing, and uh, growing up as a kid, I didn't go to some of these places. I grew up in LA or in Burbank, as a matter of fact, but my folks weren't dragging us off to the Grand Canyon or whatever. and to see those places for the first time in my life, the Grand Canyon, Monument Valley, uh, Canyonlands, Bryce Canyon, um, on and on. It, it was like, oh my God, all of a sudden your, your vision is, is opened. And um, we, we really gleaned a lot from that trip. And said, so we gotta, we gotta get that feeling. We gotta get the feeling of sundown, you know, in the Grand Canyon. We gotta, you know. And so, it it was a necessary trip to kind of solidify that. And yet, the stylization was not hyper realistic, which I personally, and I know Kelly too, did not want to create that. But to to have this this almost. Um, uh, a bit of a magical aspect to it, but you know, rooted squarely in the West. Yeah, yeah, it's beautifully done. I mean, there's nothing uh, like overly enchanted about it. it. There's a reality to it, but it has this sort of m mystical quality about it because it is the West. Um, you know, when we think of a Western, that brings all sorts of conjures up all sorts of imagery. But this has its own unique epic sweep to it that takes it does. such a range of terrains and landscapes and worlds. Um, and I see that you know that there's a lot of emotion to the shot sequences and to the uh, composition again of the film and the characters. It's just so visually dynamic. Um, it's also a powerful story about enslavement and freedom. I mean, these other themes that are just all throughout, wafting all throughout. Um, I cringe when the bridles are put on and you see that in the, you know, how stultifying and, and frightening and, and terrifying and, and uh, horrific that is for Spirit. I mean, just through his movement. Um, let's take a look at some of the examples and um, hopefully we can speak to some of that as we as we see those so Matt if we could cue those up yeah I think you know I thought just show this because we're already setting up the idea that this is rather you know subtly but there that it's about horses you can see it and it's going to then take you sweep you into the canyon there so it, it there is a, a a bit of a little bit of magic to where we're going with with the story and the kind of thing again which 
such a rich tapestry here. You're, the more you see it, the more these things are apparent that you're visually uh, kind of foreshadowing a little bit here. This is, mm -hmm. And let's move to the next one because, and this is an, a, what, three minute shot, this opening scene? Yeah, easily, easily. And, and you know, we wanted to kind of give a, a great panoramic overview of the beauty of this, of the West in, in this kind of, you know, uh, one long fabulous shot. And it really, you know, it did what it needed to do, obviously. But the, the magnificence of the camera work, the animation, that eagle, the eagle, which is, you know, the, the very creature we start with in the beginning and the very same, you know, animal that greets him when he returns it just it's a lovely kind of bookend too and a great example again of technology serving the narrative the story absolutely being able to visualize this I and mean, that to me is i think one of the most powerful impacts of this is it sets you right into the world absolutely it's, you know wow this goes on forever <laughs> what a great place to be <laughs> well it like you said we are getting the sense of freedom and you know, I, I will tell you, when this movie came out, it was obviously post 9-11, but not that long after. And I had hoped dearly <clears throat> that it would have been an uplift to people. Um, I, I thought it should be played at the White House. You know, I was in my head about this whole thing. And, um, it, you know, with with movies opening the way they do, whatever is flanking it movie-wise on either side, if you don't come in as first, you know, in the box office, everything falls apart. It's such a, it's such a crazy world. And um, I can't, I think Scooby-Doo and there was another movie coming out at the same time. So I think Spirit came in third, but I wanted it to be hopeful and powerful to people. And I think it, it ultimately has. I know a lot of grown-up uh, young women now who, you know, I loved that movie when I was a kid, and it makes me happy. Ultimately, as a director, it's it's the journey and what have you given people, and are, have you made their lives better in some fashion, whether you gave them hope or you you encouraged them or you you know inspired them. So I was hopeful the movie would do that. And I think it found its way. Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk about that a little later as we go. I think, you know, it really is one of the best examples of, of visually what cinema can do. You know, not just animation, cinema, in terms of creating a subjective experience for the audience. And, and I, I, as I said, when I put this on again, even, I was even more cognizant of how... I felt the, once those ropes started coming out, I was like, <gasps> you know, I was reacting, you know, not in a darkened theater even. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Open to, wait a minute, ah, and it, it just had such impact. I, I think this is a great example of something, a uh, great inspirational example for, for future storytellers to really make a good study of this film. The work you guys accomplished here is just phenomenal. Let's uh, move to the next slide. And again, we're still in that fabulous opening sequence. Right. And uh, this is kind of a, a nod to the Grand Tetons, but, um, you know, just one of those moments where you wanted to see the scale and spirit running, you know, with this, this magnificent eagle. And it, uh, a powerful shift in terms of uh, color. Uh, do you work with a color palette? Did you work with a color script at all on this? Or? Well, you know, that's that's what the uh, art director and production designers or, you know, Kathy Altieri on this film did magnificent work. And yeah, you, you really do have a color script that every film I've worked on to kind of get the emotional journey. Um, through the visuals and how you're going to feel you know, from the beginning, middle, end. And uh, there was great, a great deal of discussion of how we wanted to portray this. This is bright, this is happy, this is hopeful, you know. 
his freedom, his land. So it, it suggests that. Oh, it's evident all throughout. Let's move to the next slide. And as we get to, again, another really beautiful, dramatic, uh, just composition, color, tone, all of yeah. that. All is well. He's fallen in love with rain. She's showing him his world, her world rather. Um, and it's, it just needed that kind of beauty and delicacy, you know, of them together. And I thought this was just really so, so well done. And again, visually told, no dialogue, no. <laughs> but, but the use of music at this point too is also key. Um, did, uh, was Hans Zimmer again on? Yes. Uh -huh. and, 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 um, yeah. What were the conversations like? Uh, in in the discussion of music and the role it would play, well, you know, you always have uh, a kind of a idea of what you wanted, and we put in temp music. We used music from Rudy, which had such a nice driving. You know, you get used to the the, the temp music, which is kind of bad, but it had the right feeling to it. And Hans, uh, you know, he knew what what we were going for and he created you know these themes and along with brian adams songs that had just a, a wonderful emotional thread throughout you know everything from here i am to you know get off of my back to sound the bugle it just it added so much emotion and depth um even when he was being recorded i remember he needed to record Sound the Bugle, and he had just come in from London. He was really bone tired. He was, and it was late when we were doing the recording. And um, his voice was, you know, really rough. And that's what you hear in the song. And Jeffrey was all for it, you know, let's do it again, you know, and, and the emotion is so beautiful. I, I can't, you know, I'm every frame of the film, I'm, I'm very, you know, cognizant of, but I remember that night particularly, and the emotion was so raw, and that's what you hear. Mm -hmm. so. Well, speak a little bit about that. Uh, my, how do you check yourself? I mean, do you, I call it being too close to the canvas sometimes. What do you need to do when you are so cognizant? Simply aware of every frame you're working on, but then stepping back to get the bigger picture and what kinds of things? Talk a little bit about that process for yourself. Well, you're you're hitting you know a really important part of any creative process. Uh, you get too close, you you don't see anything, and you lose your obviously you lose your your perspective, and that could happen and did happen many times particularly on story, with story, because uh, it's so subjective. And if, if the powers that be are seeing it one way, and, you know, as the directors, we're going, but no, it really needs to, you know, and you're going back and you're going back. It, it, it then can become the law of diminishing returns or throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And that can happen. So, and I've seen it happen many times. And then you go back to your original idea. But before that starts to uh, un unspool, I think you get up, you step back, and you need to get some uh, distance and a, and a breath of air. And I, I recommend that to any creative person. Otherwise, you, you just, you know, you lose, you can lose focus on, you can really, you don't want to start doubting yourself. Um, but it, it ha it's happened in, on every project I've been on, where it's like, do we like this? We do. We, it, that's, it's not clear. I don't understand. And so, all right, then we need a scene. We need a close-up here. We need to know this. We need to know that. So um, it's a miracle <laughs> cut out how any movie gets done. It's, it's usually because we have no more time and money, and we got to get this, you know. But... Um, it could never, it, it never is finished, but you have to make it an end to it. <laughs> um, let's switch to the next slide. And again, we, we're here with this great. Oh yeah, yeah. This is uh, 
spirit and rain returning home. But, yeah. Are you keeping, you know, when you've got uh, such a wide open range of places and, and looks, was that with with what script you're working with or which with what sense of storyboards how are you um you finding a new way to convey the homeland finding a new way to to remind the audience that we're we're where we need to be without being repetitive to without right. being redundant you you can do that with direction what direction the character is traveling spirit is taken away from his home so he goes from left to right then he returns back um it was how do we put some of these iconic places in there and we tried to you know cherry pick what we thought would work well again there, there was so much to choose from but okay you know logically he could come here through there you know and, and kind of make our way back you know to his origin his origin but um, I, I think, you know, it was a, a combination of what made sense to us, what would be most visually spectacular. And again, things are starting to brighten up. He's, he's coming back home, you know? So it all kind of plays into the uh, psychology of it. Such a key part of that. Um, let's go to the next slide and, and let's talk a little bit about psychology and how you apply that to visually conveying it. What you know, these kinds of through composition and what that can resonate with an audience and and the psychology of that. Yeah, well, here he's he's home and it is uh, the peace and, and tranquility and the familiarity, and then he sees his herd. So it's the journey, the journey that culminates in his freedom once again, and with the horse that he he loves, who almost died, you know. And there was some discussion about that too. So, um, yeah, you want to end on a high note. He he came through it, and that was a big part of this thing of overcoming adversity. We wanted a character that the audience could identify with, that when bad stuff happened he he worked through it he fought through it and he ultimately gained his freedom through little creek actually but uh you know you got to create a character that you, you want to root for and that was really a big part of the equation too a character that doesn't talk but you know what he's thinking and you know how he's feeling and you want him to to succeed in the end. Yeah. No easy task, that's for sure. Let's move to the next slide. Now this, um, the next slide then would be with the canyons. Um, Matt? There we go. Yeah, it's it wasn't in any real order here. And it, the next slide is, is kind of a, a, a follow-up. But I just liked this shot, this was, was really kind of a, a nod to Bryce Canyon. And of course, this is where Spirit and Little Creek, you know, the jump off point, but just to get that feeling of the impossible and the scale, you know, so I, I grabbed it. Yeah, and it's such a pivotal scene too, where you think he all is lost and then summons up the strength and courage to do the seemingly impossible to to leap that span and uh, oops you <laughs> don't, don't want to give anything away but uh it's it's one of those great kind of pardon the pun but a cliffhanger moment where you're really thinking oh my gosh he's he's trapped and yeah was, what is he's gonna have to do it and you know, the next slide is that so if we're you know no spoiler alert i think people know <laughs> 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 Matt and get to the um yeah. there we go yeah making that leap yeah. a leap of faith in many ways that's exactly what it is and that it, it's very very much you know um the idea that we wanted to get across you know it's it, it virtually impossible but this this horse could do it because he was just that kind of a, that yep. kind of a guy 
But it, and it's beautifully done because even there's a little bit of surprise, like, oh, I actually did it. And I actually did it, you know. And then, of course, the, the following moment of uh, the colonel. Uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide then. Well, this is uh, before, but I just wanted to show this as a kind of a personality moment where you had, you knew spirit couldn't stand this guy and uh, the feeling was mutual. So it was getting all of the emotion that we could in the in expressions in uh, the, the horse whinnying and making his own normal sounds to convey his emotions. And that was a big part of this movie too. I mean... Oh, incredibly so. Language, uh, the horse language that I sat with our, our wonderful editors for hours, picking the right take. What, what does it sound like? He's saying, yeah, that's perfect. You know, I mean, you'd be amazed um, how to, we had to create that to make it, you know, come across. What well, it was like. I know about that because I, I know James Baxter has talked about using the eyebrows and mm -hmm. Uh, posture form of spirit to get the emotion conveyed but I the other thing that stood out for me was you know were you guys recording horses forever and ever for audio what were you, was well we had uh, a <laughs> tremendous amount in the library and and the editors would you know seek and find and they had a they had an incredible uh, group of, of range rather of emotions and horse sounds that you know were were used over and over but not you know to the point where you could really recognize it but you had to get kind of a language out of wow. these horses when they were you know happy or sad or and it, at times I thought you know is, is it going to become really tiresome but it, it was modulated I think in a really good way and we knew, we knew what, what spirit was thinking. And I, I think it really was highly successful. And, and to your point earlier, to this day, I'm glad we decided to take a chance, take a creative chance that made better sense for the film. Absolutely. Really brings, you know, another thing I try to convey in my, to my students is that it, it's about uh, the emotion more so, dialogue is there to stir, serve the story, not to be the story. Right, right. Um, too often, you know, if you're told too much, I insist on getting your money back because it's a disservice to the art form and, and the craft of what you're doing because it calls for the audience to bring themselves and the filmmaker to carry the audience forward in, into a new way, a new experience. And you that's what I think is so great about this film. You guys definitely made that possible. You, you took animation and pushed it to a different level with this film. And I, I think it's one that really is deserving of further, uh, you know, it's, it's timeless in that regard. So, and no easy task, that's for sure. Um, yeah, I love the dynamic between these two characters, and this image is so strong. Just, again, composition, the two, you know, striking <laughs> posture of these two, two characters is, you know, they are forces to be reckoned with between the two of them, and yeah. uh, it really helped to establish that. And, um, uh, and, you know, the fact that they were adversaries, and at the end, the colonel sees the true heart of this horse enough to say, you know what, I got, I got to, I got to let you go. I, you know, a lot of people didn't like that. Um, you know, we could have had spirit get away and that was, you know, end of, end of it. But the kind of strange reciprocity that happened at the end, I, I think was good. That I Love that. People, you know, you, you can recognize uh, and say, I, I honor you. So off you go. I thought that was a brilliant, noble choice. I, that spoke volumes to me and said so much about both characters. It almost in a way redeemed the, the captain to a point for the, all the horrific. And I thought, what a fascinating way to sort of end that character. Yeah instead of you know most villains are just all the way to the end are the you know the evil villain but this 
it was a really, I thought, a very noble and bold choice, and it worked beautifully for me. I helped to elevate the entire film. Um, let's move to the next uh, slide. So this, you know, the relationship with he and Rain, uh, which was really endearing and delightful, needed to just, again, have communication where her attitude, her knickers, her, her talking and, and neighing to him and him being obstinate and stubborn and having, her having to take care of business here. It was just an example of you knew exactly what was going on in that conversation. It would be something like, you know, you're not going anywhere. Yes, I am. No, you're not. I'm going. No, you're not. I'm, and I'm going to show you. Boom. She sits down. And then, you know, end of story. So it was, again, the, the use of, of pantomime, if you will. And it was just a great example. And it's, uh, this is where they actually, he softens and realizes she's pretty special. So. Yeah. yeah. I think it, Mark Davis called that the business of the characters. And, I'm, you know, yeah. talking yeah. about but I think, you know, that's also another really important area in terms of visualizing stories, the dynamic between characters and um, sort of that activity and, and uh, personalities coming across and, and the, how they play into or against each other is so important visually. And uh, this is such a strong example of that. Well, she was a, a sweet, gentle mayor who who could impress herself upon him and you know i liked the the idea of the, the strong female <laughs> even yeah. with this you know wild stallion very sweet well i think that's an important point as well um it, dare i say if you were not directing if it were solely kelly or a, a couple of men directing that would probably be a very different dynamic a very different it, it, it could have been could have and, been all kind you know, of dynamic, you know. Luckily, you know, uh, my partnership with Kelly on uh, on this movie as co-directors and as heads of story on Prince of Egypt, uh, I, we had very different styles, but they they worked well together, and you know, that's what you want mm -hmm. when you're, you're having that kind of a partnership. Mm -hmm. So. Great collaboration all throughout. My yeah. God. Um, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, I, I really, you know, there were some wonderful moments, dynamic moments in the film. The, the saving of trying to save rain in the Whitewater River was so, how do we do this? How is it going to make sense? How are they going to go over the waterfall? You know, and it, it was the use, we were starting to use CG more and it was so beautifully realized by um, the artists, the layout artists and everything else, how we figured out the dynamics of this sequence. And it was just one of those really heart rending moments and the one, what follows is even more so, but how is this horse gonna save this mare in this turbulent, you know, uh, river and it, it just showed the the love and the heart and oh my god you know she's just been wounded he doesn't know what's going to happen to her and he's going to you know risk his own life so it was an incredibly exciting moment in the film very emotional let's go to the next slide Matt, metal and, and then we we come to this where he realizes she's injured he can't help her and um it's it, it's just heartbreaking. And then he's, he's captured and taken away. Um, luckily, Little Creek comes down to come to her aid. But this was, again, an example. The animation is incredibly poignant and beautiful and just heartbreaking. And, uh, every, and the music, you know, the music is swelling and it's breaking your heart, you know, simultaneously. But this is what we could do. And I was just, it was very thrilling to me to be able to, to tell this story this way with him helpless. And, you know, I, I'm just, I, I don't mean to get too broken up about it, but 
this was a powerful moment, many powerful moments, but um, this was so beautifully executed. Yeah. So beautifully executed. Yeah. I, you know, it's, and the impact of that, I mean, that's, if it's not handled properly, <laughs> I mean, this has got to be almost a precarious thing to, um, you know, making the right choices to get the right moment conveyed. And if it's not, the entire picture kind of doesn't work. I mean, how daunting is that? <laughs> well, again, you know, it starts, big shout out to the story team and everybody who was on it, because that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. We had just heavy hitters, you know. Um, so it's calling then on your talent to bring forth, conjuring up everything they have to, to bring it to this moment in many ways. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Getting everybody on the same uh, page, as it were, when visualizing this. And it, it, it succeeds on so many levels. I mean, there's such a great jubilant joy when she appears. You know, <laughs> I found myself again, having seen this film years ago, refreshly watching it going, wait, is this where does she? Oh my gosh, wait, because you think she's gone. <laughs> and then for her to reappear is just magic, but it works, you, you get it. And again, I, I remember thinking, oh, perfect, you handled it beautifully without you know, magic film happenstance, you allow the audience to put the pieces together that, oh my gosh, that's right, she, she is okay, you know? Yeah, but we had, you know, there were these moments that I didn't pick a shot from um, where he, Spirit is captured, then he's, he's sent on the train, the boxcar. Mm. I'm really sorry I didn't. Uh, where he envisions his herd. And I believe that was Ronnie Del Carmen who did that. And we needed to do something really ethereal and and something to bring spirit back to the real world and I've gotta I gotta fight this. So, you know, creating that image of his his herd calling to him was really powerful. Um so many moments, uh, you know, and again, I, I'm really sorry I can't go on and on with all the names, but you know, watch the movie again and see see the incredible artists on it who participated. But I'm very proud, very proud that we captured that kind of emotion in this film. And I, I live for that, I really do. So, you know, and not all bleak. You have to have levity, you know, I'm not total, you know, downer, but this movie was modulated in a... In a Absolutely. Way. You do kind of an emotional map of the film as well, uh, very much like a, a color script. Would you, would you sort of map out the emotional range? Well, we, we know, you know, in each act what has to happen, obviously, and, and what the arcs are going to be for the character. And mm -hmm. um, it, it kind of works its own way but spirit being a very strong character and, it, and it's not an overly complex story yeah. you know it isn't he didn't need to go see his shrink in act two you know it's like <laughs> he's a beautiful wild horse who wants to you know be free and yeah. he, he meets unexpectedly an indian boy who he trusts and there are these wonderful moments who understands his heart too and so he's going to let him go at the end well, I think that's the magic of this film is it's it's uh, I, I want is the simplicity, but there's such a uh, sophistication to that simplicity. Is it, it that word is not correct for it? There's an eloquence to that simplicity, and it had you got heavy-handed with it. I mean, this story required that, and I, again, that speaks to how it's masterfully told and envisioned, is that you didn't get heavy-handed with, or out in left field with chaos and, and comic relief, and, you know, it just beautifully, masterfully, sophisticatedly handled, so. Again, though, to your point, Mindy, th those were choices. There were other characters. We had a whole other way to go with the story where there was a frontiersman originally hmm. and that choice to 
simplify things and really make the main human to spirit be this young Indian boy. It took some time to get around to that that uh, version. So that's the thing when these films start, you know, a few years later, you, you kind of go, oh my God, you know, it's never what you think it's going to be. Yeah. They, we've, we've, in other primary sources, we've talked with filmmakers about the evolution of a project. And, and so how are you keeping and maintaining your vision of this story throughout? When you, do you have to go down those roads and make the discovery that mm, maybe it isn't really serving the story. Let's go back to what, uh, how, how can we make it uh, work without that? Or, you know, talk well, a bit about those choice, that process of making those choices. It, it is, there's, there's, you know, some trial and error. And that's why we, you know, would, would screen the film like every so many weeks, every 12 or 14 weeks, make, you know, make changes, screen it again. But, if, if an idea pops up that's stronger and better, case in point, in the beginning, um, when Spirit <clears throat> chases off the mountain lion and, you know, has that whole tussle, it was going to be another horse originally, that he was fighting a, another uh, stallion. And I forget who made the comment, somebody was at the screening and it was like, shouldn't it, shouldn't it be like a, you know, mountain lion or something? And it's like, oh God, yeah, it should, <laughs> you know? So after having gone so far, I think some animation had been done, we had to backtrack and we, we, we you know, retooled the sequence to be, a mountain lion that was going to prey on the little foals. So stuff happens, you know, and. But it's all there to plus to, to make it. It, it is ultimately, hopefully, you yeah, know. You know that the choice has to be made and, and what you're doing. It's, you know. A couple more images, uh, Matt, let's go back to the, um, I think our last three or four there. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so with spirit escaping men, mankind, and the, you know, the idea was how can we do something spectacular? And because it was the time frame where the Transcontinental Railroad was being built, one of our artists, one of our uh, visual development artists, I think his name, it was Don Morgan, actually. He said, you know, they actually took an engine, steam engine, over the Donner Pass. And I thought, are you kidding? Did they really, they did do this. And they wanted to get it there at a certain time and whatever. And it was like, you know, the light bulb moment of, well, that would be pretty spectacular of spirit making his escape, you know, with this giant engine and the sled and the whole thing that becomes, you know, even more destructive as he makes his, his escape and sets the forest on fire. And it, it was like manna from heaven. <laughs> what a great idea. And, you know, that happens. These kind of, you know, happy moments, happy accidents, whatever you want to call them. And it, the more, you know, we thought about it, though, that's pretty, that's pretty intense. That would be great. So this is how that scene came about. Well, and it, it, again, speaks to what a great statement about, you know, the train and tracks and fences and suddenly how that chewed up the, the great West, those sweeping right. and places. And uh, for spirit to be able to overcome that, to single-handedly. <laughs> well, and and, and go ahead, Mindy. Well, it just, I, I think that sequence with the, the, um, the fire sequence that follows, it, it, I literally had to stand up and, and really watch because it, it, I thought, my gosh, this is like Bambi, one of the great, you know, most horrific scenes. And I thought, oh my gosh, this really, 
we haven't seen anything like that probably since Bambi and it speaks volumes. Let's well, it, it was a, a kind of a wild idea. I mean, he escapes using his ingenuity. Well, to back up, he realizes, we had to convey the fact that Spirit realizes this is going, if they keep going, they're gonna to go to his homeland and that's the end of everything. And had to put that together and what am I gonna do? I'm gonna fake my death. And the horse is looking around like, what the hell's going on? And, and it, it was kind of a, a, I think, wonderful, wonderful kind of uh, move to make and then have him dragged away. But in the nick of time, he, you know, kicks the, the couple of the train and, and, you know, the rest is kind of history as he blows up the the forest but and then he's saved by little creek and i thought okay is that just going to be too darn convenient will everybody think that's just out of the blue but they back it up and little creek had been making his way to find spirit so i i thought okay he, he found his he found his horse that's a great moment let's uh, go to the next couple of images because i think that's yeah definitely speaks to that yeah i mean you know if you're going to go big go big and him escaping this <laughs> steam engine was, was pretty fantastic i i, I love yeah, a really incredible sequence uh and then the next slide too with the uh horse yeah. powerful powerful moment and i think again going talking about emotion it was such a great kind of a you know when you think again all is lost <laughs> oh, he's, he gets saved and Great team up. He had saved my life. I will save him. Yeah. And uh, uh, masterfully handled, just beautifully handled in um, great storytelling, uh, visually, emotionally. And then our final slide, um, you know, that reunion, that that moment of, you know, you've we we've bonded through what we've done for each other. And I got to let you go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah big powerful emotional moments and all throughout and beautifully handled and I think again what I, I speaks volumes to me about this film ironically is that it isn't speaking at you it is showing that to you so uh, powerful um, there was a lot of cutting-edge uh, technology in spirit as well right kind of the blending of 2d and 3d in, in different ways well we you know did combined in certain areas certainly in the canyon chase which was really great we would you know used cg liberally with the herd sequences um you know again some wonderful cinematography camera work done and yeah it, it was a you know combination of of the two and probably the last 2d film i think i mean after this i think shrek was up next so it you know it was kind of the end of an era yeah very much and there's a real timing a, a pace a rhythm to the film uh just I, and i'm not talking musically i i'm talking motion and, and movement and there's there's a certain feel to it a certain rhythmic beat to it in in places as well was that something you were uh, working for, striving for, or did that just sort of organically appear? <laughs> I, I would venture to say it's, it was just the organic nature of things because combined with the music and the actual events and how they were handled, again, I, without making it sound like Spirit is an overly simplistic film, hmm. I think it's restrained elegantly uh, in many areas and in its storytelling. Could we have jazzed it up with a million other things? And like you said, you know, uh, sidekicks and on and on and on. We, we started off that way, more or less. And, you know, the choice was we're gonna tell a really kind of a, a drama with, with music and it'll have light moments and it'll have, you know, select areas where it's gentle humor and kind of endearing but um 
it was his story. It was, you know, and to keep it as such was, was the key thing. It's, it's powerful. I, I'm one of our strongest animated films out there. Um, we've got a few questions in the chat. Matt, do you want to, uh, let's field some questions for Lorna from, from our. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So our first question is from Nathan, who is talking about uh, Prince of Egypt, who says, uh, so much of the epic scale and deep emotional beats feel very directed towards adults. Did it feel that way when you were making it? Were you trying to make something that felt wider than just a children's film? Hi, Nathan. Uh, I think we were. I know we were. We wanted to honor the intelligence of, of young people, yet it was, I believe, a movie that wanted to be, was created to be seen by all ages. I mean, it's certainly not a, a, a young child's film at all. Um, but it, it was meant to serve a bigger purpose on that level, viewing audience wise. You're, you're absolutely right. And definitely achieved that. Um, I think that's again, one of the great strengths about that film. Um, what's next, Matt? Our, our next question here is from Darren, who asks, how do you balance the creative storytelling and artistic processes and in incorporate suggestions, demands and requirements? Well, uh, hey, Darren, I think the word you said, balance, is really it. So many ideas are coming up that you have to really look at when you're in the creative process and making a film is very intricate. So you have a lot of scheduling, you have a lot of meetings, you have a lot of, uh, we're making a film by committee, which is daunting and all the more reason for people to be very clear, to be on the same page, and uh, to be moving in the same direction. Uh, when you have a finite amount of time to make a film, it really puts you in a certain direction to do your best to not spend too much time doing things you don't need to do. In other words, You've got a script, you're gonna go over the script, you're gonna figure out you know, what the story is about, you're gonna visually develop it, you're going to storyboard it, you know, it's gotta go through all of, all of these different paces. But when it's a large crew and things get crazy, you do have to have balance and step back and make changes sometimes, even in personnel. It's, it's you know, it's a big, it's a big thing and if there's a, any part of that, Matt, that I didn't answer? It seemed like a... No, I think that was a good answer. Thank you. Okay. And, you know, there's a lot of navigation you have to do, especially within a studio context between executives and, you know, trying to keep the wheels turning on this and, and having the answers at all times. And that's a lot to juggle as well, in addition to keeping your eye on the story and what you're trying to visualize. Absolutely. Talk about some of those challenges a little bit. Well, it, it is a multi uh, skill set that's necessary, Mindy, just like you said, because not everybody is up to speed on things or they see it, you know, in another way or, you know, and with, with creatives, you're dealing with very intelligent, sensitive people a lot of times. I mean, it's just a fact and you want to be respectful and you want to let people know they're doing a great job. And if something needs to be changed, you got to do that in a way that is, is equitable and clear. So, you know, I'm, I'm speaking more as a, as a director, you know, what, how you, you go about doing that, but it's, again, it's a miracle things get done with, all of the moving parts involved. Uh, and that's what good, good production people are there for. I value the production team like crazy. They, they're keeping everything, you know, on time and spit spot and, you know, keeping people where they need to be or taking them where they need to be. So it's a, it's a huge thing. That's very different right now, considering, you know, where, where we're at. So, but under normal circumstances. 
No, no, again, no easy task. And uh, if I guess if it were that easy, everyone could be doing it. <laughs> I've felt that way many a time. <laughs> Believe me, you know. Special, special soul to be doing that. Matt, I see we have a few more questions. Let's. Um... Yeah, we have one here from Christina who's asking, what are your most influential artists, or who are your most influential artists and must read books? And do you have any uh, drawing exercises? Ooh. Influential artists. Um, I, I have to say most of the Disney, if I go way back, most of the Disney animators were very influential to my way of thinking. Um, any, I would say any of them, you could look at their work and, and be inspired. Uh, I loved the designs of Freddie Moore. I'm going way back here, but I would say early Disney influences painters, um, illustrators. One of my biggest influences was a, an illustrator named Wesley Dennis, who um, did some of the most beautiful illustrations of dogs and horses that when I was a kid, that kind of set my course. Uh, the other amazing artist is Rien, I'm not saying his last name properly, Portlivet, who is a Dutch artist who is a master on every level. And many of his books are out there on horses and the forest and animals. And there, he has a book called Noah's Ark that is to die for. That was hugely influential to me. Um, I forgot who, who else she, <laughs> she was wanting to hear about, but... Um, uh, they also asked if you had any good drawing exercises. Drawing exercise, well, it depends on what she wants to do. I mean, figure drawing naturally. Getting good at the basics, it, to me, is, is how I started. Um, taking, you know, great figure drawing classes, composition classes. Um, you know, Google is, is fantastic for looking up visual, devel visual development in, in any studio. Um, but I think if you, you, if you want to be a really good artist, you just have to draw and do a million bad drawings. As much as you have to do that, you have to. And, and just say, what do I love to draw? Where, where can I sketch? Um, just make that, you know, first and foremost, as part of your, your day to get some drawing in. Whatever inspires you, even if you're looking at a, a photo of something and you put your take on it. You just have to really keep the, the exercise of drawing going every day. Yeah, Christina in the chat uh, specifies that she's interested in backgrounds and layout. Oh, backgrounds and layout. Well, perspective, getting some really good perspective classes will help. Uh, and, and I have to say, just look at, you know, the different artists. Um, think, think of an animated film you like and, and look that artist up and Google Viz Dev on that movie. And chances are you'll or see their website and see their portfolio. But just do a little, little hunting as to what appeals to you and you'll find it. When you, uh, for, for Spirit, for example, when you brought in your visual development teams, would, would you send them in a particular direction where there other artists work, Frederick Remington or, you know, others, since you wanted to capture this Western scope, mm -hmm. would you send them in a direction or give them some suggestions or let them explore what? Well, we looked at different artists for sure. Maynard Dixon, uh, Frederick Remington, you know, any, anybody who stood out in that school of, of painting at that time and then kind of developed it from there but you know the plan was not to to no. replicate but just to get some of the dna in there mm -hmm. and is that something you're still applying in in other projects uh, do you look to you know if i want to give this uh you know if i'm going to be in egypt for a while i'm going to go explore what that art, art was like at the time or you know or if you're going to be on planet Mars for a while, are you looking into uh, other things or are you relying on your own? I, I think 
combination of these? I, you know, I have to be jump started. I have to be inspired. If, if it was like, okay, I need to go to Death Valley to get the feeling of whatever, um, or go to the ocean or go, you know, I mean, I've done that in the past. And I think artists all agree with that to just kind of bring in the visuals and the, and the, uh, sensation of being in an area that inspires you aside from looking at any number of books and films and God knows what, mm -hmm. but I have to feed myself with a lot of different things, you know, to then go, Oh, you know, to point out where we're headed. Matt, I think there were maybe a couple more questions. I want to make sure we get to our, yeah, here's a question is, um, is there a story that you would love to be a part of or love to direct? Mm. <clears throat> I think there is <laughs> because um, personally, I, I absolutely love the mystical. I love animals. I, I love, you know, creatures in general. And I think there's a place or something that hasn't been really delved into yet. Uh, fantasy, whatever. I'm, there's there's things in the ethers right now, and I would love to be a part of something that could make me feel I'm using whatever I have to bring something meaningful forth. And uh, it's not. I'm in a, in a development situation right now, which many artists can relate to, directors, and looking at a couple of projects. But I've kind of vowed that unless I can put my heart into it 110%, I, you know, I'm not going to invest that two, three, or however much time and energy it's going to need. And I'm working on a couple of, of original ideas too. So the creative process, no matter who you are, beginning, middle, end of your life, <laughs> It's there. It's there for you. It's there with you. It's there to guide you. And it's there to save you, quite frankly, I believe, you know, and we have to, as uh, creatives, really take hold of that no matter what's going on in the world or the universe. So yeah, it's, uh, it's an ongoing project for me. Are there uh, new discoveries you continue to make? Talk about that a little bit. When you when you're imagining working on a project, are there um, things that continue to surprise you about this problem? Well, right now it's, it's, I'm surprised that I still care uh, and want to do it because I've, I've been in the, the industry a very long time, but I've also learned you are, you are fit for this into your older age if you have something to offer. You've seen it with, with film directors, you've seen it in live action. I'm just saying, if you have something to say and feel really deeply um, connected to it, then you should still be using your craft and working your craft. But I, you know, I just wanna continue storytelling in the best possible way with wonderful people on wonderful projects. and. And I don't want that to sound like I, I won't work on certain, I storyboard when, when I'd like to or need to, and I'm very happy I can do that. I mean, becoming a digital artist was a big switch for me. And um, I, I like Storyboard Pro a lot. It's very user-friendly and, it, and working from home or remotely is, uh, it's part of what we can do as artists in our business, which is great. So, but between that and, and saying, where can I put my energies? And, and as I said, there are a couple of things I really can't chat about right now, but that I have interest in, and I hope it's mutual. Mm, indeed. I just want to wrap out, uh, Matt, do we have any other questions? Yeah, I think we have a good one to end on here. Which okay. Is, um, what is an aha moment you've had in your career? That is a good one. It's really good. Who is it from? That one's from Tina. 
From who? Yeah, from Tina. From Tina. <laughs> um, that we're we're here to, to to we've been given gifts as artists. And when I've had moments that were not pleasant, disappointing, as as I go through this journey, that aha moment is it's important. It's important to believe it with all your heart that you have something to express and give if you're in this business or you want to get into this business. And that once you start trusting yourself, whatever comes your way is, is not going to defeat you. You'll have your moments. But if you want to be an artist or be an animation, particularly, you have to be strong and you have to, you know, really dedicate time and effort and yet have balance with it. And I can't stress that enough because things will go really well and things sometimes go not so well. And you can't uh, blame yourself. You can't feel like it's over. You're here to, to learn and get stronger and be a better you know, cre creative soul, better human being more than anything. So let it, let it shape you, let it, let it strengthen you. And that's what I think to me is an aha moment that I have to keep realizing in fact that it's important the work is important how you how you think of yourself and give yourself that uh, ability to do the work and not get in your own way that can happen too <laughs> you know just be who you are learn from other people make your skill set you know really strong and tell your stories and work with people who are, you know, like-minded and get a lot of experience in the process if you're starting out, you know, um, it'll help you. Great, great words to end on. Lorna, thank you so much. It is such a joy to get a chance to sit down and visit with you and explore these amazing films and, and your artistry. And we are grateful audiences for your work. We want to see that continue so thank you for all that you do well i'm equally grateful uh, it's a real pleasure it's a real honor and you know may everyone be well and continue and keep creating amen to that well i want to thank you i want to thank all of the great ctn teams both uh in the backgrounds making this all happen we hope to see you all in future episodes here at primary sources and Lorna, perhaps we'll have you back for a panel or some other uh, great opportunity where we can uh, pick your amazing brain and explore uh, your visual take on storytelling even further. So we have some terrific events coming up. Uh, check the listings. We have uh, some exciting folks uh, that we're about to be announcing as well. So definitely get to CTN. Um, ctntickets.com for our future lineup. You can find uh, more information about Lorna there and her great work. And um, remember, always look for primary sources. So thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Mindy, and thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure.